good kitten internet. This is a processor. You have one in your computer, you have one in your desktop, laptop, phone, tablet, watches now. Pretty much any component these days has something akin to this. It may not be the size, may not be the shape, may not have all of these pretty little things on the inside, but it's a processor of some type. And I wanted to talk to you today about what in the world any of them mean and which processor is right for you. So this processor that I have here in my hand is an older processor. It's an Intel Core 2 Duo. Most of the processors I'm going to talk about today are Intel processors, mostly because it's what I'm most familiar with, but also because they have the largest portion of the market that is for computers, as in PCs, not as in tablets or phones. It is what's referred to as an x86 processor. x86 actually refers to an Intel 8086 way, 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 way back. The Intel x86 processor got its start a really long time ago, like as in the first computer that I ever used, the one that I basically grew up with, was a model above the Intel 8086, called an 8088. The same instruction set, which I've actually coded those instructions before in assembly, the same instruction set is used on that computer as is used today on any modern desktop or laptop. I mean, there's been changes, of course, there's lots of additions, but in general, if you were able to code assembly code for the most basic of processors, a lot of the same code would work today on modern processors. So, what are these things, anyway? Let me put this down before I break it. The first processors in the Intel line are the Atom series of processors. As of what Intel just recently announced, there'll be Atom X3, Atom X5, and Atom X7 processors. They haven't given the specs for the X3s yet, but in general, these are the processors that you would expect to see in a phone, or in developing markets, or extremely cheap, extremely low power devices. We are talking one watt of power, or TDP, thermal design power. One watt of TDP means that it should drain at most one watt of power. Sometimes Intel processors will average going, uh, draining a little bit more power for very brief periods of time for performance gain without actually increasing the heat. TDP is meant to be a heat measurement, namely it will radiate one watt worth of heat. In general, the more something takes in power, the more heat it will produce, especially for processors. So the X3 is likely going to be a dual core atom, which is what most atoms are today. It's going to have an extremely small performance impact. I mean, it'll be something that will handle something like this. Probably worse than this, to be honest. Um, ARM processors exist in this realm, and I'm not going to go over too much in the way of ARM processors. This is primarily for Intel processors, because it's what I know better. Um, you can tell this is not exactly the world's thickest phone, or device of any variety. There's no spot for a fan or anything like that, so it has to be pretty low power, low heat, and be decent with battery life. The Atom X5 and X7 processors are quad-core, low-performance, low-power draw processors. We're talking about two watts of power here, so definitely more than what you would expect in a phone, but not really by much. I think phones are like one and a half at most. Not sure. I should probably look that up. Okay, Google. How much power does a phone processor use? So phone processors use usually under one watt of power. Now this is Intel's rating things at peak power utilization. ARM processors are usually rated at average power utilization, so obviously this is going to vary quite a bit. But two watts of power probably right out in a standard phone form factor. Tablets, on the other hand, this would probably be perfectly fine for. So we're not aiming at the iPhones, we're aiming at the iPads here. We're also talking about very low-end Chromebooks would probably be using these style of processors. They're going to be very cheap, they're very power efficient, and they're very low performance. You probably don't want one in your devices. If you just want a phone, I'm sure a 
an Atom X3 would be perfectly fine, but you're not gonna buy a phone based off of what processor it has on the inside. You're probably gonna buy a phone based off of its other features. If, on the other hand, you're in shopping for a tablet that's going to have some very basic features, namely, I wanna view one website at a time, not much else, or some type of very strange project setup that you just need a weak processor for, that's where the Atom X5 and Atom X7 come in. Next up are the Core M processors. The Core M processors are Intel's newest and latest creation, although they've always had something similar to this. Uh, the Core M processors, we're getting up to like 3.5 watts of power now. This is enough to be able to run lots of things. The most famous Core M processor is actually the modern MacBook. The modern Mac, which was just released a few days ago, yeah, this is running a Core M processor. This is a, we'll still say it's a low power processor. These are targeting laptops and tablets that do not have fans, but at the same time need some pretty heavy performance. They're also very expensive at the moment, and that's usually one of the drawbacks that you would hear about a Core M, and why a lot of people are really pissed off at Apple for making the MacBook, is that they're really expensive. Uh, the processor in a MacBook is actually more expensive than the processor in the MacBook Air, even though before it was the other way around. The MacBook was the low-end device and the MacBook Air was the medium-end device. When it comes to Core M processors, the actual speed and stats really don't matter at all. The important part of a Core M processor is how the manufacturer handles cooling it. The idea behind them is that they can spike up to some really high speeds, the same as Core U processors, which I'll explain in a little bit, but unfortunately, they can't maintain that unless they have reasonably good cooling. And if there's no fan, that means it needs to have either a giant heat sink, which costs lots of money and adds lots of weight, or it needs to dissipate into the case itself, which will scorch your lap, or it's going to throttle or slow down the moment it gets a little too hot. So that's useful for, say, loading a web page really fast, not very useful for actually doing any productive work. So Core M processors are ideal for standard, I want to use a laptop to browse the internet, read email, and not a whole bunch else. You don't want to do video editing on a Core M processor. You don't want to game on a Core M processor, unless you're talking about like lighter weight games, a la the Candy Crushes, or older emulated games, or you know, even really old emulated games. You probably can't even pull off a PS2 with them very well. They're also really good for battery life. You can have some absolutely stellar battery life on these things, and that is awesome. But we're not talking about a performance demon here. From there, we have what's referred to as Core U. These are the Ultrabook processors. They're very similar to Core M, except, well, you need a fan now. So if you've noticed, a lot of laptops have fans. The idea behind a fan in a laptop is that your processors and or other components are producing enough heat where it'll eventually cook itself, or cook your lap, or cook your palms, or anything like that. Whereas with a fan, then you at least have some form of exhaust for that heat, and you can draw in fresher and cooler air. U series, U stands for Ultrabook in this case. The Core U processors are the latest and currently highest powered release of the Broadwell series. There'll be more Broadwell processors later, but for right now, this is about as far as it goes. They all require fans, they have reasonable performance. You're still not going to be setting any speed records. You still don't want to do video editing on one, but, you know, older video games, some spreadsheet work, more aligned to what a business person would want in a machine. It's capable of taking a substantial amount of RAM. We're talking about machines that are up to 16 gig of RAM, usually. All of these processors are actually the same processor, believe it or not. The way Intel and other manufacturers make them and decide that this one's an i7 and this one's an i3 is by a process called binning. Binning is the concept that you make processors. You make the best processors that you can, and sometimes that doesn't work out for you. Sometimes you end up making a processor and part of it's damaged. Rather than chucking out the entire processor, what you do is that you release it as a cheaper part. The Core U series, for a, I know for a fact, is very subject to binning. You primarily make the Core i7s, and then those that, say, for instance, have a slight issue with their cache, become Core i5s. They're pretty much the same processor, it's just a few settings tweaked and a couple of things disabled. Further on down, Core i3s, same situation. Sometimes a processor ends up really good. You end up with really good stability on these processors. That causes two effects. One, the i7s start coming down a little bit in price, and two, they start going, you know, this is a perfectly good i7, 
but we need to sell more i5s, so we're going to disable a bunch of features and sell it for less, maybe even at a loss. The next series of processors is hard to name. Broadwell, the current generation of mobile processors, doesn't really have any of these yet. I believe they're intended, but they're not officially released yet. So we're going with Haswell, which is the previous generation, or the generation that my laptop is, for instance. Haswell processors, they're called M, as in Core M. They are what you refer to as mobility processors. These processors, which are Core i3, Core i5, and Core i7, just like the Ultrabook ones, thanks Intel, they are more power hungry than the Ultrabook processors. In turn, they're also much faster. Chances are, if you are wanting a mobile workstation, these are the processors that you're looking at, not the Ultrabook processors. Ultrabook processors are a little on the weak side. The Core i3 processors are generally dual core and very similar to the, say, Core i7 Ultrabook processors, but substantially cheaper and more power hungry. So you're not gonna get very good battery life out of these. The Core i5s are very similar to the Core i3s, only with a little bit more cache. The Core i7s, some of them are quad-core. The quad-core Core i7s are substantially more powerful than the rest, and a lot more power-hungry. You're talking, rather than our standard, you know, one and a half watts that we started with, we're up to like 45 watts. Speaking of 45 watts, that's actually in the realm of desktop processors, which is what I'm going up to next. Desktop processors are much more powerful than mobile processors, but they're definitely not meant to be crammed into a laptop. Some upper-level laptop manufacturers actually do cram a desktop processor in a laptop. Some manufacturers actually cram a mobile processor into a desktop. I'm looking at you, Apple. <laughs> actually, it's pretty common to use a mobile processor in any quote-unquote all-in-one computer. Those are like iMacs where you have the monitor and computer just built into one, but there's no battery, it doesn't have a de keyboard plugged in or anything like that. So there are multiple power envelopes, I guess you would say, of desktop processors. They generally run from around 35 watts of power. You notice that is in fact lower than the upper level of laptop processors, Intel is weird. Up to, I believe the most that I've seen on a standard consumer desktop processor is, is, what is it? 260 watts for AMD? Something completely ridiculous and horrible on energy efficiency. This is the realm of you buy a desktop, you build a computer, this is the type of processor you're getting. There are some desktop processors that use less power, they're typically a little slower and either more expensive or the same price as one that's faster and just uses a little bit more power. But in general, you are talking about, once more, Core i5s, Core i5s, and Core i7s. Core i3s, are dual core with hyperthreading. If you remember, that's what the Core i5s were in the mobility processors, and the Core i7s in the or i nah, the Core i5s in mobility processors, and the Core i5s and i7s in the Ultrabook processors. <sighs> the Core i5s are quad core processors without hyperthreading. So the Core i5s are more like the i7s in mobility, and the Core i7 desktop processors are quad core with hyperthreading. So it's another step up. You have typically more powerful processors. My desktop is a Core i7, for instance. It's the top of the line desktop Core i7. There's actually tiers above it as well. As mentioned, if you're building a desktop, chances are you are looking at a desktop processor. And let's be honest, you're probably not looking at anything above a Core i5 unless if you do, say, for instance, video rendering. Now you know why I have a Core i7, don't you? The next tier above that are the more workstation processors. They're designated with a 5 at the start for a desktop, which would normally be Broadwell. They're called Haswell E's. It's confusing, just don't try. They start at 6 cores. They have two 6 core processors and one 8 core processor, I want to say, or it might be one 6 and two. No, it's two 6s and one 8. Um, they each have hyper-threading, so Windows will see either 12 or 16 cores, it's really 6 or 8. They use different types of RAM, and to be honest, if you needed one of those, you probably know what they are. Alternately, you are probably not building a computer anymore. So that's the, my general rundown of processors. Where does ARM and AMD fit in? Well. ARM processors are usually toward the lower end. They're very similar to, say, 
the Atoms and the Core M series. You can get the occasional one that can probably outperform, say, a Core i3 Ultrabook, maybe even on some workloads a Core i5 Ultrabook, but at that point you're getting into the you have a specialized video adapter on your ARM processor, and that specialized video adapter is better than Intel's onboard video adapter. Yeah, video stuff. The CPU itself is usually weaker, but it's not quite an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So, some things will be faster, some things will be slower. AMD. AMD has their own set of processors. They are all roughly two to three generations behind Intel's right now, so you can get some reasonably good performing processors, but they're not going to be very energy efficient. What I've generally said about Intel processors applies to AMD. They have different names, though. There's also AMD throws a nice monkey wrench in and has APUs, or... Yeah, what that says, because I can never remember the acronym. I'm going to edit it in later. APUs are basically all-in-one CPU and graphics processing processors. They're much more power-hungry, they're physically larger, but the idea is that you don't need a graphics card with them. They work better than Intel's onboard graphics, that's for sure, but you're not going to be playing video games at 4K resolution or anything like that with them. However, they're probably AMD's most popular processors. You know why? Because that's what the PS4 and Nextbone have. Not joking. They really are running AMD's APUs. A mobility processor from Intel can actually run circles around them. That's my summary for this. I hope this has been educational, and I did a real vlog today! Finally! If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I may not have been fully accurate on this. I'm not doing this with a script, because I had the idea at work today and decided I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. Good night, Internet. I will see you tomorrow. Oh, yeah, and probably film a little bit more of Boo.